evening, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us tonight uh, to learn a bit about how Shakespeare in Prison works. Um, I am Franny Shepard Bates, and I'm the founder and director of Shakespeare in Prison, which is Detroit Public Theater's signature community program. Um, we will actually be celebrating our 10th birthday throughout the month of February. Um, and if you are interested in learning more about that and get on our e-newsletter list, uh, which you can do at our website. Um, we are thrilled to present this webinar in partnership with the International Shakespeare in Prisons Network, of which we are very active and enthusiastic members. The Shakespeare in Prisons Network is a global forum for the prison and community arts practitioner community, promotes the production and study of the plays of William Shakespeare within prisons and alternative settings, and advocates on a local, national, and international level on behalf of organizations engaged in arts programming for and by incarcerated and post-incarcerated populations. I will tell you more about our program, um, but first I want to um, pass this off to my fabulous co-presenters and, uh, and let them introduce themselves. Uh, Matt, Matthew. So I'm, I'm Matthew Van Meter. I'm the Assistant Director of Shakespeare in Prison. Um, I am also a, a journalist and author, and I teach at University of Liggett School and College for Creative Studies in Detroit. Um, and we also have Sarah, who's an alum of the program. Hi, I'm Sarah Hannon Lauderdale, and I was an alum uh, for, well, I, three years inside and two years now um, in the Shakespeare Reclaimed program. And I am also a co-contributor to the Richard III in Prison published book. And that's right. We are actually um, creating a critical edition of Richard III. It's uh, going to be called uh, Richard III in Prison, a critical edition. And it is the first critical edition of a Shakespeare play that has been written by uh, incarcerated and formerly incarcerated people. And uh, if you're interested in learning more, uh, it has been only possible to create because of what we're going to be talking about tonight. Um, and you can learn more at our website. Um, and Emma, our fabulous intern, is going to post a link to that page right now uh, in the chat. Um, if at any point in the evening you have questions that uh, that you'd like us to to get to during the the Q and A portion of this, we're gonna we're gonna talk and show a fabulous slideshow for about forty five minutes, and then we're gonna open it up for questions and answers. But you can send those along in the chat or in the Q and A, whatever works for you, um, at any point. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to get going on this. Shakespeare in prison. This is what we're going to be talking about tonight. Okay, our mission. Shakespeare in prison's mission is to empower incarcerated and formerly incarcerated people to reconnect with their humanity and that of others, to reflect on their past, present, and future, and to gain the confidence, self-esteem, and crucial skills they need to heal and positively impact their communities. In practice, this encompasses an ensemble of incarcerated participants engaging in a months long process of putting together a play by Shakespeare. The program also offers support and connection to alumni post release. Our approach attempts to avoid the pitfalls of doing Shakespeare with people in marginalized communities by centering the program around the voices and experiences of participants, uh, specifically by creating an environment in which ensemble members can empower themselves. We prioritize process over results and personal empowerment over artistry. Uh, Shakespeare in Prison is very explicitly neither a class nor a traditional rehearsal process. Um, facilitators are not teachers or directors, and incarcerated ensemble members are not students. This non-hierarchical approach democratizes Shakespeare by giving participants complete ownership of the process, from interpreting the text to conceptualizing the performance. Uh, we won't be talking about how Shakespeare in Prison got started. We won't be doing a comprehensive program overview, overview, but I would be delighted to chat with anyone who's interested another time. Um, Emma will be posting my email address in the chat, and um, please do not hesitate to reach out. Um, tonight, we'll also be focusing on the research we've done with the women's ensemble, but everything we're covering is held true for the men's ensemble as well. Um, Matt, would you like to take us to the next uh, slide? I'd love to. So tonight we're going to talk about three things. Um, so we're going to talk about how Shakespeare in Prison works. Um, and particularly, we're going to talk about the case study we did in 2016-2017 season when we were working on Richard III at Women's Huron Valley Correctional Facility in Ypsilanti, Michigan. Um, and, we'll, and we'll talk first about the, the, the findings that 
we uh, that we reached with that case study, uh, which was about the process um, and and sort of what happens in in the Shakespearean prison season um, for individuals and for the group. Um, we're going to talk then a little bit about the research methods. How did we gather data um, and uh, uh, record the material and and, th and then eventually analyze that data to come to those conclusions. Um, and, and then importantly, we're going to talk about outcomes, which was not something we could have measured at the beginning because we were still figuring out how the program worked. And so we'll focus on the, the three long lasting benefits that we've discovered uh, to Shakespeare in prison participation, which is self efficacy, positive sense of community, and enhanced empathy. So uh, uh, we'll get to that in a little bit. Speaking of our case study, why did we do it? Well, Long ago and far away, um, uh, a, a, a gentleman named Kyle Fishergrant joined us as a facilitator. He would later go on to become uh, the assistant director of the program for a time, and the lead, uh, the, the the lead on this case study that we did uh, that he and I started talking through in 2015, and then we actually executed it in our 2016 2017 season with the women's ensemble. Um, and uh, when after Kyle joined shortly after he joined as a facilitator, he asked me, so how does this program work? What's what's going on here? And I was like, we do Shakespeare and people are empowered. And he was like, right. But what is what does that mean? Like, what does empowerment mean? And I was like, it's it's I, you know, I'm <laughs> I'm an artist. And Kyle said, well, we should figure this out. Let's do a case study. And um, and that's exactly what we did. Uh, we decided we wanted to uh, to track the process to answer the question of, of how it works, which was something none of us could clearly articulate, and which is something that is really difficult to articulate for uh, not just prison arts programs, but like a lot of different kinds of arts programs. How do you how do you talk about how it works and what the outcomes are? Um, so so Kyle did did all this work to figure out. Uh, what what our framework should be and 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 how we should put this together. Um, we decided ultimately to to do this study ourselves um, because it was very important to maintain our non hierarchical philosophy by being really clear with ourselves that our responsibility was to be facilitators first and reachers excuse me researchers second. Um, and and because of this, whatever that may have cost us in rigor, um, it made up for by ensuring that our program's dynamic wasn't altered which in turn allowed ensemble members to have the same experience they would if no research was being done at all. Um, and so if I missed anything, we can cover it in the Q&A, um, but I wanna move on to, uh, to the next slide, which will be um, a rundown of the case studies framework. Yeah, so the framework for the study, which was which was developed largely by, by Kyle Fisher Grant uh, before we began the study itself, um, was uh, it was really connecting some ideas from from disparate uh, fields of academic study. The first is narrative identity, which is a um, sort of foundational concept in in psychology and sociology that was developed uh, several decades ago. And it's this idea that your your identity um, is uh, takes the form of a story. It's sort of you you are in some sense the story that you tell yourself and others about yourself. Um, and it, obviously, it's more complicated than that. But I think that's that's a uh, a, a pretty useful um, the overview of it. And then uh, we were connecting that to this to reader response theory, which um, comes out of uh, literary studies uh, in the middle of the 20th century and is, is uh, uh, again, sort of a, a, a oversimplification perhaps, but uh, it essentially is the idea that you, you bring yourself to the text, that, that a text does not inherently mean anything without a reader to put meaning on it. And that we exist in what are called interpretive communities and a community of people will bring their own understanding to the text importantly and that the text has no fixed meaning without the reader putting the interpretation on it uh, and importantly that the uh not only do you does your identity change the text but reading a text any text can change your identity as well and so we wanted to expand that into the into the theatrical realm and, and apply it to the work we are doing in, in Shakespeare in prison. Um, and the last thing is is a just a really fundamental concept in in clinical psychology, which is the idea of a turning point, which is a perceived redirection in someone's life, an identifiable identifiable um, redirection in a person's life that that they that they perceive. And the, those are um, in the clinical literature really associated with positive life outcomes. 
Um, we also decided that we wanted to track uh, two different processes that we thought were happening with Shakespeare in Prison. Mind you, we, we had had several seasons of Shakespeare in Prison before doing the case study. And we figured that there were basically two things happening. There was a theatrical process, which was performative, literary, and analytical. It's everything that has to do with theater, um, with the reading of the plays, the discussing of them, the acting, um, getting into a character, all of that stuff. And then there was an operational process, which is uh, uh, everything else, essentially. It was membership and collaboration in a group. Um, that was not specific to the theatrical context, um, uh, supporting other members, um, overcoming a fear of performance, uh, which is, again, not inherently theatrical, um, uh, uh, dealing with the challenges of memorizing lines, which the, the lines part is sort, of, is sort of theatrical, but overcoming challenges is, is not. And we decided that, uh, that we wanted to track those two processes as they went. Um, we also decided we wanted to uh, gather information um, really from four sources. We, we used observations um, uh, that were in the form of notes by facilitators. Uh, also facilitators gathered verbatim quotations. Um, we also gave each ensemble member a journal um, with no particular directive about what to write in there, but, but sometimes that we would collect those journals and, and, um, and, and log those entries. Um, and we had several fo focus group meetings um, during the, over the course of that season of the case study to, to gather some more information as well. And we'll describe in a little bit more detail how, how we recorded those observations um, later on in the, in the presentation um, and, and how we turned those observations into data. So, and actually, Sarah, Sarah's a great example of, for, of, of both of these processes. Um, and I wonder if Sarah could just say something about um, a, a, a particular theatrical, you know, process, memory of, or experience that you had? I, um, so for theatrical, a, a good example for me would probably be um, in my second season, I played Macbeth in Macbeth and um, doing a lot of the analyzing, trying to figure out how we want to perform certain scenes. Um, one particular scene was where um, Macbeth is revisited by the three witches and the text seemed to suggest things like he would go to a different place like like a cave or some something away from where they were at and for me um, when I was reading it and and thinking about how I wanted it to look I didn't see that at all um, in fact I felt like those witches were kind of always with him and I thought it would be kind of a cool thing to recreate that scene as more of like a dream sequence where they're surrounding him um, and saying their lines and Macbeth is dreaming and then he wakes up and interacts with them and they're already there like in his castle. So that was um, a theatrical example of how I interpreted the text. It's great. There's so much going on there. I love that. Uh, mm -hmm. And what about an example of an operational experience you had in the group? Mm -hmm. Um, so operational for me, um, and it's kind of a theme for me throughout the whole three seasons while I was um, at the Valley. Um, for me, it was showing up, um, being, trying to make my attendance like record <laughs> was like a goal, but also I just felt it was out of respect for the facilitators. Um, I, I wanted to be there. Um, I felt like it was important to be there. Um, just to show my dedication and my commitment to the program and, um, and, and let them know that, you know, I, I wanted to be there because they wanted to be there as well. Um, so that, that's probably an example of operational and just also supporting um, some of the other ensemble members, you know, encouraging them to get up and, and take a part or participate in sharing or reading or anything like that. That's an operational part for me. You did have just about record attendance. I know. <laughs> so, so we found uh, a number of things that the keys were um, that it was really clear to us that the operational and theatrical processes happen at the same time for everybody, not always in the same quantities for everybody, um, but they are all, they're both happening all the time. And there's not, there's not sort of a binary switch there. There's also no one right mix of processes. Each person has unique needs at different times um, and an individual person might uh, go back and forth between, between their processes being more theatrical or more operational over the course of several seasons or one season or even the course of a single session. Um, and for and, and the it's people's ability to sort of dial that in that makes the program so powerful and that was not something we had really thought about. 
Um, and we also noticed that, that those turning points that we talked about uh, are usually signaled by a change in, uh, in, in sort of in thinking, feeling, and connecting. And so I'm going to let Franny explain what that's about. Okay, yes, with pleasure and gusto. Um, so once we had completed our case study, so this was nine months of working on Richard III with the women's ensemble. Um, and so the, 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 the researchers, myself and Matt and Kyle and uh, Laura Montgomery, another longtime facilitator, we got together, we discussed our observations, we looked at our notes, and we decided that we wanted to track three things. We wanted to connect, or we wanted to track where people were uh, thinking things through. They were uh, analyzing, problem solving, and strategizing. We wanted to look at where they were having, um, um, making statements or reactions or actions that were uh, based in feeling in their emotions. Um, and then we also wanted to look at where people were connecting, where they were connecting with other people where they were connecting with characters, uh, feeling empathy, identifying with others, and also where we were connecting with other people in the room in, in building our ensemble, which is so fundamental to the work that we do. Um, we found that all three of these things happen in both theatrical and operational ways. Um, uh, for example, um, uh, textual interpretation, like what Sarah was talking about, that would be a thinking, thinking in a theatrical context. Um, but, but thinking in an operational context could be something like working around um, somebody's school schedule. So we know that somebody may be absent, um, you know, if we were meeting two nights a week, which we were Tuesday nights and Friday nights, that somebody for a class may be absent on Tuesday nights for a while. How do we work that out so that they can still be uh, equal participating members of the ensemble and working toward accomplishing whatever goals they've got? Um, we broke those general categories down even more fully because it's always more fun to do more work, and we will cover that in a few minutes. Um, so that's where we were with the, what we were tracking in the case study. Something important that we stumbled on a couple of years later um, and want to touch on right now was the need to track whether a participant was speaking um, or acting on behalf of themselves, on behalf of, on behalf of others or on behalf of the ensemble as a whole. Um, and for short, we categorize those observations as me, you, and us. Uh, and now I'm gonna throw it back to Matt. So to show you the power of tracking these observations, we're just gonna zero in on that thinking, feeling, connecting, and the me, you, and us that Franny just talked about. Um, and uh, so I wanna look at the changes in, in one ensemble member during one season. Uh, at, at Huron Valley. And, and since Sarah was present during the season in question, um, I'm actually gonna ask her to describe what she observed um, in her fellow ensemble member. And so let's start with the first part of the season. Sarah, Sarah what, did, what did you observe in this ensemble member when she joined the group? Um, I would say the first part of the season, um, she was pretty withdrawn. Um, she was quiet. She seemed fearful. I was actually, um, I, I, pretty, I was pretty sure she wasn't going to follow through for the entire season. I didn't, I didn't know if it was really for her. Um, so, and I did not think that she would take on a role at all. I didn't even think she would make it to performance. Yeah, yeah, and it's, it's interesting. You can see that in the chart. Um, the, she spoke very little at first, but um, fortunately she was a prolific journaler. Um, and so, so we have actually really good records for her at that time in the season. Um, and uh, although she spoke and, and acted very little in the group at first. Um, and, and as you see in the chart, she was largely emotional. Uh, she was sort of in her feelings and, and really focused on herself at that point. And that, that's not inherently bad. That's really common um, in, in all sorts of people. Uh, you know, it was, but it was the status quo. That was what she, how she was coming to the group. Um, mm -hmm. What about the next part of the season, Sarah? What, what did you see there? Yeah, so the next part of the season, um, she did begin to open up, um, mostly about um, her her ideas of like how she was interpreting the text. Um, she ended up taking a, on a role and really um, seemed to just have a great understanding of her care of how she wanted her character to to act, to feel, to to present. Um, she was just really, you saw these like glimpses of brilliance um, 
still quiet a little bit, but she was definitely opening up and, and starting to like really be a part of the group. Yeah, and uh, you, know, you can see that in the chart too, where the, where the proportion of observations we had of her, of her thinking, you know, and in this case, particularly sort of literary analysis and, and, and thinking about strategizing about how to do things on stage. Um, you know, really uh, was a big change. And you can see that she opened up as well to, to talking about other people um, and acting on behalf of other people. So, so what about right at, right at the end of the season, Sarah? How, what was the kind of end game for her in that season? Yeah, so right at, so near the end, um, not only did she uh, take on a, a, just a huge role in the play, which, um, she was encouraging others, she had again even more ideas about staging and lines she had her lines memorized so quickly and i i was like in shock and the other thing was um i, I near the end i i always thought of myself as a leader and i wondered um like who would take on that role once i was going home um because you need somebody to do that in that group you know you just never know who it's going to be and I definitely saw it in her. I was like so excited that, you know, somebody was going to step into that that role of like encouragement and and again, showing up and being a good example. Yeah, and you can see that too in the in that final set of, of pie charts where um, the the you know, she really opens up the the sort of connecting part of her. A lot of what she was talking about was connection with other with other people. Um, and and two. Uh, the the uh, everything that she was doing really opened up to individual other folks and and to the ensemble as a whole and it's you know th those are the you know those are the charts of a of a leader in the group um, you know and, and and we we use this example because you know this particular person was such a clear cut had such a clear cut path in those ways but um, but every everyone has a journey and there are, there are many many routes to this sort of transformation through Shakespeare in prison. So um, actually, so what about the theatrical and operational processes, which we talked about a little while ago? It turns out that uh, both of those can lead to change in an ensemble member. And, and actually, I can't think of a better example of that than Sarah, uh, who had a different mix of those in each of the three seasons that she was a part of the group. And so I want to kind of walk through, Sarah, your experience um, in each of those three seasons as an example. So, so why don't you tell us a little bit about Richard III, theatrically and operationally? Okay. Um, so theatrically, I well, first, I played uh, Queen Margaret in Richard III. And reading her text in the beginning of the season, um, I, I just identified her as being such an angry person. And I loved everything that, like, how it was coming off in the text. But I just didn't identify it within myself, like her anger, but it intrigued me and I wanted to play her. Um, so getting in touch with that, those feelings throughout that season, playing her, um, I began to realize, you know what, like I actually do feel these ways. And I, I just never like identified it in myself. It took reading her text to realize like, I think she feels this way and I feel this way. So that was a theatrical part for me. Um, and operationally, um, I, when I first got in there, I didn't really see myself in a kind of leadership role. I just, honestly, I started the program just to like have something to do. <laughs> and when I got there, it was, you know, I enjoyed it and then I wanted to keep coming and I didn't want to miss a session. And so operationally for me, it just became this like learning to be a leader. Um, and being supportive of my ensemble members. I was what they called the curtain queen um, in that season. There was a lot of um, spots in, in our performance where we would have the curtain open and then we'd have to shut the curtain to change scenes. Um, so because Margaret really wasn't in so much of the performance, just a few different scenes, I was able to take on that role as the curtain queen. Also make sure that um, my other ensemble members were where they were supposed to be, when they were supposed to be there, um, be on book for them in case they're on stage and, you know, somebody forgets a line, I can kind of prompt it from the sidelines. 
Yeah, that's great. And, you know, in keeping with that sort of the leadership you found in yourself in that season, uh, you took on the title role in Macbeth the next season. Tell, tell us about that. Um, yeah, so for Macbeth, um, I, I knew when I went into that season that I enjoyed being um, in that leader, like learning how to be a leader. Um, and I wanted to do that in Macbeth. And I really wanted to take on that role because I felt like I could do it. Um, what I learned theatrically was um, reading his text and performing that text. Um, I, I just learned about myself. Like I felt like he was um, just a, a good guy to begin with, honestly. Like he was this hero and he went down this path of destruction, really. Um, he became a great guy to just like a, a terrible human. And I, I related to that and how I wouldn't call myself a terrible human now, but at the, at that point, like it was just, you know, I, I felt like I was a good person and I did these terrible things. And, but the difference between him and I was that I could come back. I, I made myself come back from it and he didn't. So I, I used learning about that text to again, learn about myself and how I felt about, you know, my own self-esteem. Yeah. What about um, operationally in that season? Yep. So operationally, again, it was, I kind of learned how to be a leader in Richard III and in Macbeth, it was all about like being that that leader. Um, again, the group does need somebody that's that that shows up. Literally, like that's that's probably one of the most important parts about being in that group is you have to be there. Like you you can't experience it without being there. So, um, encouraging other people to make sure that their attendance was good. Um, also just encouraging new members to like get up and try, you know, reading, reading on their feet or participating in some of the um, improv games and really getting into how it was going to be performed and staged. That's great. And, you know, and from that to your, to your final season, which, which was Twelfth Night, you know, which is a profoundly silly play and you were possibly the silliest Sir Andrew <laughs> I've ever seen. Um, so tell, tell us about that last season. Yeah, so that was my, again, my last year um, at the Valley. So, and I knew it was going to be my last season. Um, and I, I didn't want to take on such huge role because one, I was getting ready to go home. I wanted others to experience um, having a bigger role. And the other thing was, is I was um, studying for my uh, pesticides exam um, in the horticulture program and also a tutor in that program. So I needed to um, be able to focus on that as well. Um, and I, so I wasn't going to be able to spend as much time like memorizing lines. So I picked Sir Andrew because his line, it was easy really, because he didn't have a whole lot of lines, but he was ridiculous as far as I read it. And so, and he was different because I was playing, you know, two serious roles, Macbeth and, and Margaret. They're both very serious, very dark roles. And this was like the complete opposite. So it was a little bit of a challenge to like find the silliness in me. <laughs> and turns out I'm actually kind of funny. <laughs> and it was something that I, I, I didn't really know that. And I didn't, you know, so I enjoyed making, making people laugh as soon as I was out there doing his ridiculous dances or carrying around a ridiculous horse. Um, yeah. So I, that part of it was the theatrical part. Um, the operational was kind of turning more into um, a mentor, I guess, and almost like passing the torch of being this leader to just kind of taking more of a backseat and letting others step up into that role, um, encouraging again, um, showing up, of course, and just, you know, being there. And she was, did set the, uh, the attendance record. <laughs> just for, the, for that record. <laughs> All right, so our method, and we're about to buzz through a lot of information really fast, but fear not, there is a PDF of this slideshow and, a, and, a, and some time for Q&A at the end. So hang in there, let's roll. How did we do this? Note-taking and journals and coding, oh my. There's a little goofiness to Shakespeare in prison. Um, so yeah, so we, we took, we've got all these notes and journals and uh, those and the, the, the surveys and the focus groups, those are our main sources of data. And for the most part, we, we kept doing all of that um, in subsequent seasons so that we've now got a, a few years of like really good uh, data. And, and here's how we did it. 
and and will and will do again when we're able to work in prisons again. Um, so the big thing that we do, if, if you ever visit the Shakespeare Prison Ensembles, you'll see facilitators with these notepads just writing notes like all the time, tons and tons of notes. So what are we writing down? We are writing down like the nuts and bolts of what's going on, you know, the basics. Who did what? Who is here? How did it go? Um, we're looking at evolving attitudes uh, and, and individual behaviors. Uh, did someone read aloud for the first time or do improv for the first time? Did someone seem upset or, or, or happier or angrier or calmer? And we're also looking at group dynamics. Is someone sitting to the side? Was someone acting out or withdrawing? Did someone sit with a new group of people today? And, and how did the group deal with, with, with any of those things? What was the group dynamic during discussion or rehearsal? Um, we're also, uh, very importantly, uh, recording verbatim quotes. Um, they're central and, and uh, because we always try to focus on the words participants actually use rather than speaking on their behalf. We're focusing on things like uh, connecting with the, the text through personal experience um, and connecting with, with others through the material. We're looking at uh, uh, change in the way that you tell your own story, uh, your narrative identity, or any apparent change in your self-perception or your narrative a deeper evolving understanding of the text and anything else that seems noteworthy or compelling or like really, really funny. Um, those are the kinds of things where we are writing down. Uh, now, get ready for this. After the season was over, we developed a coding system. Uh, each quote or observation could be assigned a code so that we could track what was happening over time, both for individuals and for the ensemble as a whole. This is the whole coding system, which is too much to dig into right now, but we would be thrilled to nerd out with you about it during the Q&A. Some of us really like coding um, and would love to talk more about it. Um, one thing that is that I do wanna note uh, quickly here, because you can see it kind of flowing from the theatrical process, to feeling and connecting and thinking, and then these like details of how it was happening. Um, something really, really important is that to keep ourselves honest, we, we would note whether we were assigning a code because a participant was explicitly talking about uh, whatever we were noting, or whether we were inferring that they were talking about their feelings or analyzing the text. Um, so every code has a tag to mark it as explicit or implicit. So, so the question here really is, is how, how does this work in practice? And on the next slide, you'll see just, just a few examples of, of actual observations and, and quotes that were uh, uh, from, from the, the case study season. So in the first one, um, I relate to Richard III, all my life, my family would tell me I was bad, so I acted bad, um, which is, is something that somebody said when we were, uh, when we were discussing the, the text. You know, and so that, that's clearly theatrical. It is about the text. Um, it is about connecting. I relate to is sort of like, a, like is about empathy and identification. Um, and then the sort of thir third level of code uh, uh, was 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 about a character in the in the text, right? As opposed to another person in the group or whatever. It's explicit. They're explicitly doing that, and it was and it was on behalf of themselves, right? It's in sort of an I statement. You know, and the next one, uh, which is about uh, sort of nerve, nerves around audition day and uh, but knowing that you're going to make it through somehow that's operational. I mean, it's auditions, but, but nervousness is an operational thing. Um, it's a feeling. Um, it is uh, uh, the ADR is for is uh, uh, stands for, uh, again, about uh, like you're making yourself nervous. Somebody else is not making you nervous. Uh, and it's explicit. The person's described that directly. It's on behalf of themselves, right? And so we would sort of go through the tree like that. Um, not everything had to be on behalf of you, me, or us. Um, somebody cutting their speech down to 12 lines from 20 or 25 or whatever um, would be theatrical, right? This is a speech. Uh, be thinking because it, it, it's an analytical process about the text, which is the third T. Um, but it's implicit because they haven't said uh, you know, we are inferring that they that they're undergoing an analytical process, but but they have but they have not said that they are undergoing an analytical process. We just saw them cutting lines uh, and assume that they're not doing it at random. Yeah. So the next step is to put the codes in a spreadsheet. Um, this is uh, Sarah a, a spreadsheet. Uh, this was our twelfth night season with Sarah. I have Sarah's permission to be 
sharing these observations. Um, and so this is how we could keep track of them. And we track them based on how, how frequently we observe each code. Um, and then we um, and then we analyze them from there. That's how we got those pie chart, those pie charts from a bunch of slides back. You will note that some observations get multiple codes. Uh, we found out pretty quickly that there's not always just one thing going on. Um, and in the interest of time, I'm not going to uh, to to read any of these like really uh, fun, but we've got this like really like fun theatrical stuff happening here. Um, and, uh, and then we've got this like really intense uh, operational thing, like Sarah said, uh, a few ensemble members really saying that uh, they were frustrated with inconsistent attendance and talking with the group uh, about it. So it's a really great example of that. Okay, so as we've said, the case study itself focused on how the program works. And by figuring that out, since then we've been able to use that information and our ongoing uh, data, you know, collection and, and, and analysis and all that, um, as well as being able to, to continue to work with alums of the program on the outside, which we'll talk a little bit more about, um, to, uh, we've been able to use this to help individual ensemble members um, as, they, as they work toward their goals and whatever work it is they're doing. Um, and also how, to, uh, how we're gonna measure outcomes, which is the, the, the really tricky thing we're trying to figure out here. Which outcomes do we want to measure? Um, outcomes that are organic to Shakespeare in prison and based on uh, what we do. So part of the reason we were really just looking at, uh, at the process was because we, we weren't really able to track long-term outcomes because um, at, in 2017, when our, when our study concluded, um, we, we were not able to be uh, in touch with folks after they had gone home. But in 2018, um, we received permission from the Michigan Department of Corrections to begin a post-release program with alums. Um, and, and that allowed us to, to, to talk with them, to see what they thought of all of this and if it, if it uh, reflected their experiences. Um, and then when, uh, when the, the COVID-19 pandemic hit, um, we, um, and with our in-person programming paused, um, we decided to conduct a follow-up study with a number of our uh, alumni from the women's ensemble. And this time we really wanted to focus on figuring out what those long lasting effects of participation are. Um, so we interviewed 11 alumni, alumni, and fancy, fancy ending here to this word, of the women's ensemble. Some of them were also participants in the case study, but not all. Um, Sarah was one of them though. Uh, these interviews were focused on a series of questions about their narrative identities in terms of their past, present, and future selves. We also asked a few reader response theory inflected questions that related to Shakespeare and their experience of performing and reading. And we discovered that there are three long lasting effects to Shakespeare in prison involvement reflected in these interviews. And the first is self-efficacy. Um, uh, the second is enhanced empathy. The third is a positive sense of community. And then we actually typically learn something else that we miss. But first we'll talk about self-efficacy on the next slide. And actually, because we have Sarah here, uh, I'll, I'll define the term and then uh, talk about, uh, and then ask Sarah to, to talk about the ways in which she, and, she uh, experienced you know, a greater sense of self-efficacy after involvement in the, in the program. Um, Self-efficacy is a sense of capability and purpose. Um, uh, it's a term that comes out of psychology um, and it has to do with self-reliance self and, and a, uh, a realistic, uh, it's not the same as overconfidence, it is a sort of realistic understanding of your capabilities and sort of optimism about your ability to meet challenges. So Sarah, I wonder if you could talk just a, just a little bit about how Shakespeare in Prison enhanced your self-efficacy. When I went in to prison, obviously my self-esteem was uh, completely at the, its lowest point ever. And when I started Shakespeare, um, I was kind of went on this journey of like, what am I going to do when I get home? And who's going to want to be, you know, who's going to want to be around me? Who's going to want to have a relationship with me? Where am I going to work? What am I going to do with myself? Um, you, those are things you think about the entire time that you're there. Um, and when I went through the program, it, it created the sense of just, I, I'm worth my self-worth. Like, you know what? I, I, people respect me. They like listening to what I have to say. Um, they respond to me and, um, it, it created, it helped me take on that big role of Macbeth. Um, I memorized 
all of my lines. I did not need, you know, anybody to be on book for me. And it just created the sense of like, wow, like I can do this. I'm pretty awesome. Um, I'm kind of, you know, a big deal. <laughs> and it, I took that home with me. Um, and I wasn't afraid to get out there and, and do job interviews and not accept things that, you know, I'm not going to just settle for, for anything. Um, I, I want what I want. And I, I think I got that starting in Shakespeare. That's really great. I uh, uh, want to talk a little bit too about, um, about enhanced empathy. I, th I think we all understand what, what empathy is, but uh, one of the things that we found that the folks really talked about a lot was empathy, empathy not, not only for others, which is how it's usually used, um, but empathy also for, for yourself, um, which is something that, that a lot of uh, folks who have been incarcerated sometimes struggle with. And, um, so, so Sarah, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how Shakespeare in Prison influenced your capacity for empathy. Sure. Um, so I hate to admit this, but I felt when I went into prison, I was even a little bit of a snob. Um, I, I, I did have family out there. I did lead like a, you know, quote unquote, normal life. Um, I was educated and I always had this idea, like, what am I doing here? I don't belong here. I am nothing like these other women. And when I got into Shakespeare, um, I realized that, you know what? I am like these women. Um, we've all been through some re absolutely horrible trauma. Um, maybe we we dealt with it in different unhealthy ways, um, but we're still the same. Um, we still have feelings. Um, we're still human beings. We're mothers. We're daughters. We're you know sisters. We're friends. Um, and they're and they're smart. You know they're. I thought like, well, gosh, I thought I was, you know, educated and smart, but I got into Shakespeare. I'm like, oh my God, like I'm, I'm not the smartest person in the room. And again, that sounds like completely snobby, but it was the fact, like I, it, it just opened my eyes to like, you are definitely just because you are in prison doesn't make you um, any worse than anybody else. That's really great. Thank you. The, the third thing that we identified in those interviews was a positive sense of community. And in, in the social science literature, there's been this you know, longstanding but growing um, uh, understanding that, that a lot of people's positive life outcomes really largely depend on, on having a positive community around them and having a sense that that community is there for them, um, you know, particularly for, for incarcerated and, and formerly incarcerated people. And Sarah, I wonder if you could talk to me a little bit about how Shakespeare in Prison impacted your sense of community. Yep. Um, well, while you're, while I was there inside and I'm in the ensemble, um, I'm sure all of you can imagine that, you know, prison is a scary place. And if you don't find, you know, some friends in there and some people that you can rely on, um, it's even scarier. So I felt like you found friends in there, people that you could be open with and be vulnerable in that setting and you could trust that they weren't gonna take anything that you said and and tell other people that you didn't want to know. Um, so there was that sense of trust and friendship in there. Um, and then we were able to take that home because they started the Reclaimed program, which was like a game changer. So not only were you making these friendships and these bonds with the facilitators and the ensemble members inside, but you could rely on that to know that once you got home, that wasn't just going to end. The reclaimed program really was amazing. It gave me a positive outlook. It gave me a purpose when I got home because, of course, you know, unemployed and don't have a lot going for you. Like as soon as you get out, but you could, I had them. So, yeah. You know, you know, when we were doing this follow-up study in 2020, we uh, we were. Uh, interested really only in the, the effects of Shakespeare in prison on the participants, but we asked all of them at the end of those interviews if there was anything we missed, and just about all of them said, well, yeah, the facilitators, um, which makes us profoundly uncomfortable, uh, and yet, and yet they, we have to, we have to follow, follow their lead. Um, the facilitators are a really special group of people, and I, I, I feel really fortunate to count myself among them for, for all these years. Um, and Sarah, I wonder if you could just close us out by talking a little bit about what the facilitators meant to you. 
Well, my very first memory and probably one of my most important memories was my first day going to Shakespeare and Franny came up to me and asked me what my name was to welcome me. And my immediate response was my last name and my prison number. And she shook her head and said, no, what's your first name? And that's unusual there because you go by your number and your last name, like you're not a human, like it. And to go into Shakespeare and just be like, it was like a breath of fresh air. Like, oh my God, like she wants to know my first name, which means she might want to know about me and like who I am as a person. Um, So that started it. And then going through the program, the facilitators see things in you that you might not necessarily see in yourself. Um, They're there to um, encourage you when you need encouragement, cheer you on when you need to be cheered on, whoosh you when you need a whoosh. And they are a huge reason why I was able to grow as much as I did. Thank you for sharing so much, Sarah. Wonderful. Um, So that is going to conclude the presentation part of the evening. Um, We're going to transition now to questions and answers. And there are there are so many good ones in the chat and the Q&A. And please keep them coming. But uh, before we begin to question and answer, um, I would like to invite our super secret special guest to turn on his camera and unmute himself. I am pleased to introduce the lead researcher on the case study, Mr. Kyle Fisher Grant. Say hello, Kyle. Hello. There we go. Hi, everyone. Good to be here. Uh, It's 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 wonderful to to be reunited and and nerding out again. Um, Okay, let's get to as many of these questions as we can. We find the first one. Um, Sarah, question for you. Um, we have a question. Uh, was your feeling of responsibility out of respect to the facilitators a trait you feel like you had prior to joining the ensemble or something that you attribute to your participation in the ensemble? Um, it's a little bit of both. Uh, I, I do feel like I had um, that you know, responsibility when I wasn't in prison. Um, just I did respect others um, in that way. Um, but there definitely is times that I was not, you know, I was a little flighty. Um, so in, in real, you know, outside of the Valley, um, it just being in Shakespeare and, re- and seeing how much I was enjoying it and growing. And I think the key part for me was the facilitators would show up when, you know, they have lives outside of us, you know, you know, they have jobs and kids and family obligations and all of these things. And you're in prison, we're kind of stripped away from a lot of those things. All we have to do is walk to the programs building to go join them. They have to drive there. They have to do all these things to like, you know, manage their time. And they would show up in like snowstorms. <laughs> I mean, it, the roads would be terrible. And all we would have to do is walk there. And, I'm, you know, sometimes I'd want to talk myself out of going because it was cold and I didn't feel like walking. But then I'm like, they're getting here. They're driving here. Why? I could definitely show up. That They're here for us. Why can't we be there for them? So it had a lot to do. It was both. Yeah. Um, I feel like this is sort of a, a good question um, or a jumping off point, Kyle, to, to talk a little bit about um, uh, kind of how we put together all those different, um, the, the, the surveys and the journals and our observations and stuff. Um, wondering about if, um, if our observations and impressions um, how, how we sort of compared them to or verified them with uh, the ensemble members who are part of the part of the case study and subsequent seasons when we were also uh, collecting data in the same way. We didn't set out to uh, verify that at first. I mean, most of the data collection, um, especially that first time around with that first case study, was all dictated by the logistics of the prison. We had a lot of other things that we really wanted to do. Uh, We wanted to do individual um, interviews, which would have verified that in a much more um, salient way than we were able to. And what we ended up doing was like a small group discussion, which we had to cram into like an hour, I think, you know, like stuff like that, where there, there just wasn't the time to really um, nail that in that way. So what 
ended up happening was the journals. We passed out the journals at the beginning thinking like, <laughs> maybe we'll get these back. Maybe they'll write, maybe they won't, you know, like who knows what this is. That was more of an afterthought in the original um, conception of the data collection. And then it, it ended up yielding some of the most significant results and the most, uh, the way that we were able to most verify any of our inferences with their experiences. Mm -hmm. And 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 later too, after uh, we began our post-release program, um, which I, I think I touched on this very, very briefly that like after Sarah came home and I said, look, it's the case study. And I and I and I said because we are we are we are collaborators with members of the ensemble and alums. I said like, what do you think? Like, tell us if we tell us if we got it wrong because like if we got it wrong, then we need to go back and figure out what we did because we want to. We you know like I said, we don't want to be speaking on behalf of people. We want to be you know really. Um, um, putting people's experiences out there in their own words as much as possible. And um, and of the alums who have looked at the case study and kind of talked it through and everything, like it, it, it does turn out to be reflective of their experiences. Um, but then we do keep refining it as we go, um, you know, based on Based, based on, you know, finding, finding a fourth code because some of us were going back through and we're like, ooh, I'm going to add another one because I can see it. Um, so, OK. Uh, and I feel like that 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 uh, helped to answer another question, too, about tracking data when the participant attendance is unstable, um, which I don't know if you want to add anything about that, Kyle. But but essentially, I mean, I feel like um, be because we're looking now, like not just at the ensemble as a whole, but as individuals, there will be more data for some people than for others. Some of that could be because they're present more, but some people could be present all, we started like looking kind of like comparing to attendance too, because some people yeah. would be present, but very quiet. Do you want to speak to that, Kyle? In the end, that ended up having to be one of the limitations of the study. You know, like it just, there was no way around it. And we really, once we had an even idea of like paring it down to like who who made it through the entirety of the and it just was like we can't do all that you know uh what we can do is is the best that we can with what we have uh there are so many limitations with working with a protected population there are so many limitations from the the facility we just gotta <laughs> carry on and and analyze what we got yeah. I should say that the one other way we did that was in the was when we got to analysis, um, we really shifted heavily into proportional analysis and, and we still I mean, there's still some people for whom we don't even have a statistically significant number of like observations, people who really sort of fit, uh, you know, faded a little bit more into the into the background or were, or were real shy and maybe didn't journal. Um, but but we could you can regardless of someone's attendance, we could talk proportionally about what was going on with them and, and we found for for at least half of the ensemble we had i mean usually uh several hundred point data points over the course of a season if not more mm -hmm. yeah um sarah there's a question here that um i'd actually like to pose to you um there's a did you feel at any point in your three years in ensemble um and and i suppose during when we did the follow-up interview with you as well um I mean, did you feel like you were being, do you, did you feel like you were being studied or, you know, did it, did it, I mean, what was, what was your experience like as, um, as, as, as someone whose experience was being coded, um, <laughs> you know, like, uh, what was your experience of that? Um, no, I never felt like I was being studied. Yes, you guys were writing a lot when we were talking or observing, you know, us when we were doing things and writing it down, but it, it didn't ever feel intrusive or like we were in like a fishbowl or anything um, because you guys did a good job of not only like writing things, but also still interacting with us. It wasn't like you were just sitting back like I'm gonna write this and, you know, you were still engaging. So it, it never felt like we were in a study whatsoever. Not for me. Good. That was really important to us. And again, that's part of why we decided to like really, um, make sure that like our first priority was on making like being good facilitators and being good solid members of the ensemble mm -hmm. um 
And, and so I'm really, I'm, I'm glad that that was your experience. And, and I also want to note that because of the way that things are so collaborative in the program, I mean, really core aspects of the program are determined by the ensemble as a whole. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and so the, I guess what I'm, what I'm leading to is that because, because it's not a class, um, because it's not a, a production, there's no direct, you know, I'm the director of the program, you know, somebody's got to be, I guess, but like, I'm not like the artistic director, you know, everything is done as much as possible um, by, by group consensus. And, and part of that is that um, ensemble members who are incarcerated are, um, are, are asked to, to give constructive criticism and tell facilitators when, um, when they feel like um, a part of the program may need to be tweaked or, or when, when maybe one of us, you know, is is doing something that is is uh, is making them feel like um, I don't know. I'm trying to I'm trying to think of of a good of a good example. But like somebody saying like you know, you really ought to talk to so and so more because she's been feeling really left out. And then I would say, oh, I didn't realize that I was not, you know, like. I, I don't want her to feel that way. She's so important in this ensemble. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to make sure that I pay some more attention, you know? So, so I, you know, folks really uh, are empowered to tell us like, if they, if they feel like, like lab rats, they know we don't want that. And so we would, we would change whatever we needed to, if somebody was feeling that way. Hey, can I speak to that for just a half second? We have a minute. Yeah. Um, you know, the other, the other part of this is that we were participant observers. You know, so our first job was to participate. There would be things that were in my notes that were just like a private conversation that I might have had with somebody when they were having a bad day sitting in the back while Franny was up. That was frequently how it worked, by the way. I was frequently sat in the back and hung out. And so, you know, we would all get together and have these vastly different accounts of the same evening because, you know, we were just speaking to each other, a different people. All of this data is a way to advocate for the program. You know, anyone who has worked um, in any sort of government organization knows that a lot of these programs are difficult to justify at times, and they can be difficult to, you know, say, well, Sarah's really feeling better about herself. <laughs> it's like, so what does that mean? Well, it means this, and now we have this data, and now we can produce data-driven work that is... Um, a lot more meaningful when justifying our program. Mm -hmm. um, there's some questions about um, about kind of capacity and sustainability and 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 kind of how we do this. Um, so so yeah, I mean, we'll 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 see we'll see what's going on when we are able to work in person in prisons again. Um, but um, up until the time that um, that the the pandemic really uh, began and and um, and those programs were 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 paused. Um, we did find that if, if, if there was, if there were only one of us in the room, we could still be taking a decent amount of notes. Um, and they it po possibly not as many verbatim quotes, um, but we could be taking notes that were more, more, you know, observations general, um, and, and, and things like that. Um, the more facilitators in the room, the more notes we would hopefully get. And in our facilitator training, we do train people on um, on how to take notes um, and and what kinds of what kinds of observations and quotes we're we're kind of looking to looking to capture, um, so that we we at the end of a session, everybody's got everybody drives home and then uploads their notes, either emails them or or uploads them uh, to to a, a Slack channel that we have, and then. Whoever's in charge of the uh, the weekly blog that we that we do when we're when we're working on site, um, we'll kind of put all those notes together into a into a narrative, and um, and then and then either that person or somebody else will do the entering in the spreadsheet, the coding, and all that kind of thing. So as we get back in, we will see. But um, you know, the more the merrier. And earlier in the season, there tend to be more verbatim quotes because we're not running around backstage, you know, dealing with a million different things. But um, but but yeah, I, I hope I answered that that question okay. Do we want to talk about um, Kyle or 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 Matt? Um, where is this? We've got this. Uh, Jack says uh, tragedies happen sometimes. Um, tragedies like losing an ensemble member. 
do the tragedies show up in the data and, and what have we learned from them? I think that's kind of an interesting question when we look at it kind of ensemble wide, uh, kind of those, those one, you both speak better about that than I do. You, you see it, we've, I mean, we've, we fortunately have not um, had that particular experience, but, but yeah, I mean, tra tragedies and, and, and all, all, all sorts of things happen. I mean, honestly, like, there are certain times of years year that are just like rougher for people than others and that that shows up people get a little bit more people get a little bit more introspective they get a little bit a little bit more withdrawn they get a little bit more in their feelings or they avoid their feelings more uh, uh to stay out of that um so yeah i would say it shows up in subtle ways not always ways that would be immediately self-evident just but just by looking at the data but if you know the people i i would say yes there are subtle shifts I would also say that um, one of the aspects that I, I feel like that was inherent to our study was that you, as the reader of the study, were viewing this data through our lens. We tried to um, we tried to keep all of the quotes as verbatim as possible. Tried to, with fidelity, write what happened. Um, but you know, there's this other question in here about our biases, you know, like I'm biased by the fact that I have known them for years. And when they say I'm struggling with this thing, I have a context of beyond this season with them because I've known them for years at this point. And I know what it means for them to say they struggle with this. And so just to read that as a quote, you wouldn't necessarily get that context that I have that I provide. And so you know, that it's, on one hand, it's a limitation. Yes, it is not as maybe scientifically rigorous as if someone was just observing. But on the other hand, I feel like it, it adds a richness to it. Uh, and as far as a practical approach to do doing research with just one facilitator, I mean, what we did with this was we took something that was happening already. Franny was already taking notes would take notes for the blog. And we just sort of built on a discipline that we kind of already had. We already put out a questionnaire. So we, we refined it. We already were taking notes. We refined the notes. We got better at taking notes. And then we got better at analyzing it. You know, it just, it didn't happen all at once. This is the fruits of many seasons of doing this. Um, but if you're looking for a place to start, I would start with doing something you already do and try to refine it and make it better. I want more questions for Sarah, but I don't want to make them up. Franny, I think there's, I think there's one that Sarah could speak to the phrase that's often thrown around with, with Shakespeare, which is the sort of this idea of like universal themes, um, which is, yeah, it's funny that, that has never really been one of the reasons I think of why we use Shakespeare. There's, there's a lot of other good ones, but that, that is the thing that people talk about with, with Shakespeare and I just, I, Sarah, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about moments, because I know you've had these, like moments where you were reading the text or watching a, a performance or somebody else, you know, get, getting into a performance and um, felt like the, like that moment where the text just kind of reaches out and grabs you and you, it's sort of hard to believe it was written 400 years ago by this uh, random white dude. <laughs> I don't, I can't think of a specific moment, but I just know, like, I just, I remember feeling many, many, many times, like, huh, I can relate here. <laughs> like, again, with, you know, Macbeth going through being a hero to like wanting something and then doing the wrong thing to get it. Um, I mean, that resonated with me <laughs> in my own life. And um, I think there was a specific, uh, session that we were talking about Richard and the and Richard and Anne and that and the Richard the third play um where he woos her into um convincing her to being you know being his wife when she started out the scene like hating him and I was thinking to myself and I think I even said this like this is like you know Anne's like a like real world like Shakespeare version of like the real housewives or something like she just wants something so you know it's a theme that 
especially for women using a man for your um like to be your savior or to be your protector um she couldn't do it on her own in the play and i feel like that's it it, it definitely shows and even just our society today where you know women look to somebody to you know for approval and usually that's in a man and that you know doesn't always work out too well for them so yeah there is definitely a lot of themes there that you can see even and I, and I think that's why it worked a lot too is being able to it's easy to relate to yeah and and building on that in terms of our our process uh and our approach um is that like what sarah is talking about that was a, a huge debate that is still ongoing because <laughs> we're putting together a critical edition of richard the <laughs> third are you a publisher we want to talk with you <laughs> um that's 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 my that's my that's my entire pitch no it's not but what sarah's talking about is a years long debate with like all of these women and 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 the facilitators who worked on this on this play and so so operationally it's it's kind of this like mush but it's mostly a theatrical thing where people are bringing their own life experiences to to this conversation about this scene and then none of the facilitators are telling anybody what to think of it so there aren't any answers. We're like, yeah, no, that's what's cool about Shakespeare is that it's open-ended. So we can keep arguing about this for as long as y'all want. And so now we're entering year, we're in year seven of having this debate and it's wonderful. I want to really quick, I wanna make sure I hit this question because it's an important one. Um, and Victor asked, what part do these case studies play in justifying Shakespeare in prison to stakeholders and seeking grants and funding? Um, and that was when we were going through the case study and also figuring out how to, how to report out the data was like, who are we doing this for? And so for one, we were doing it for, for, our, for our, our ensemble and for our, ourselves you know, in, in our work with the ensemble, we were doing it with, uh, in keeping in mind other prison arts practitioners or other people who just do do arts programs and have a hard time measuring outcomes like can we maybe contribute to that can we help and we're also thinking like okay like as 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 um as stakeholders and funders and, and departments of corrections um, um really want to focus more on things that are evidence-based and data-driven um maybe we should have some of that and and so so that was one of the one of the reasons to do this, and it has been one of the one of the really you know positive outcomes of doing the research beyond the way it's enhanced our ability to you know execute the program is that um, we do have all of this um, information that is not you know, we love telling stories, but is not just storytelling to kind of say like here is what's going on here, and we take this very seriously like um, and so you know you can take us seriously. And, um, and so I think that it's been a really great way of um, connecting with people who are really interested in what, what's the evidence that this works? What, what kind of data do you have? Um, and so um, it's really been, uh, I, I feel like it's probably been crucial uh, in, in the program's success it's also I should I should mention it. I mean, it's something that we even the coding of it, which is which is real tedious, um, but but rewarding as Franny alluded to earlier, like we, we continue doing that because the benefits were so great beyond whatever research or like publication those those will come to we never even you may have noticed we never even got to the point of like doing analysis on the sort of that, that sort of shadowy third level of code. But they're there, and I think there's a story in there. I just don't know what it is yet. And so we have, in some some sense, much more data than we know what to do with. And so what started as a justification to funders really became an integral part of how we run the program. Right. Um, Sarah, uh, there's a question question for you. A couple questions for you that I think are kind of tied together. Um, I mean, before before coming to Shakespeare in Prison, your your past self before Shakespeare in Prison. Mm -hmm. um, the questions are what had your experience with Shakespeare been and um, and in terms of your learning to be a leader in in the ensemble um, do you feel like like you were really like learning to be a leader there or that you already had leadership qualities and finally had a chance to reveal them um my experience with Shakespeare was pretty much none I think I maybe in high school I think I had like a short semester of or in English where we learned like maybe one Shakespeare play I don't even remember what it was um so I, I had no idea um 
that what the whole program was about. I learned a little bit about it from one of my um, roommates at the Valley. She was very encouraging about the program and, and told me a little bit about it. So that's well, like, well, sure, I'll try it. You know, it sounds fun. And she, I just done, never envisioned it to be what it was. Um, I was really, again, I was just looking for something to do because you have a lot of time. Um, so no, I didn't have hardly any experience with Shakespeare. I was a little bit nervous about being able to understand it and, and perform it. Um, what was it? Sorry. What was the other question, Franny? In terms of, do you feel like, um, you always had leadership qualities and your experience in the ensemble helped to reveal them? Or do you feel like you really, uh, learned to be like you, you've, you know, like people say, I didn't know I was a leader or, you know, things like that. Like, where were you coming um, from when you came to that? That's, I never really was a leader um, before then. Maybe I did have some of the qualities because um, I do feel like I'm a very good listener and a really good, um, you know, supporter of other of other people, um, like to be like a bit of a champion for others. So I guess those would probably would be leadership qualities. I just never really had um, an opportunity to to use them or um I didn't even realize I had them, I guess, until I started, you know, Shakespeare. So yeah, I, I think that that definitely brought it out. And of course the facilitators are very encouraging. Like once they see just a smidgen of like leadership, they're like, they'll, they'll call you out. <laughs> they will, you know, encourage you and make, you know, well, why don't you do this? And come, you know, they, they definitely brought it out. I remember when when I had to uh, I had to take on a role in Richard the Third, and I I had been going to be I was going to be the curtain queen. I mm -hmm. like pulling a curtain, and then it was like, nope, Franny is not going to be able to do that. And I said, oh, Sarah can do this. And I was like, Sarah, look, <laughs> curtain plot. And you were like, what? And I was like, you got this. And that was right. Yeah. You were you were not all about it at first, but then like within not very much time at all. I don't know, ten mm -hmm. minutes. No, maybe it, it wasn't long that you like no, you had it down. Long. And the next year you trained someone else to do it, mm -hmm. which was pretty cool. And yeah. it was it was it was really it was neat. And you were a very good curtain queen and just a really solid person to have off. Uh, not off book. Well, you were off book for your own stuff on book for the rest of us. Yes. Yes. We, more questions about how um, like what do we do with our notes? What do you got, Kyle? There is a reason that we started talking about this in 2015, actually ran the study in 2016, and then didn't have anything in writing until like 2018. I mean, this was a time intensive process with a full team of people doing it. I would steal our stuff. <laughs> <laughs> really? I mean, you know, like this is, it, we don't own this. This is not, this, the reason we're <laughs> having this webinar is to be like, take this, use our coding system, write notes the way we do, steal our coding system and put it in an Excel sheet, you know, like it just straight up and, steal it. Like, and tell us how it goes. <laughs> yeah. And, and the more, the more groups we have doing this with like a, a common vocabulary, the richer the data will be later. So what I yeah. would do. I want to just really quick because I didn't say it before and I and I should have. Um, this webinar is actually the brainchild of an alum of the program who, while she was in Shakespeare in prison, uh, formed a goal to work in nonprofit. Uh, and um, and then she got out and um, I mean, long story short, now she does. And she's kind of a wizard. And um, and she was like and she told me she's like, you realize like people don't actually want to read a case study. And I was like, I do. She was like, but most people don't. And you guys need to do a webinar. Uh, and because, because you need to be, you need to be sharing this more with more people and you need to be doing better. And <laughs> I guess, I guess that's a real, so this webinar is a really good example of like how, how, how people really take ownership of this, of this program and they do it through this process. In terms of the Shakespeare and Prisons Network, which I which I, I just saw a question pop up, um, that that is a that is a, a was founded in in 2012. 
it was formed to uh, kind of bring all of these programs all over the place together that were kind of operating in in, in isolation and silos. I mean, when I, I this is a this is another webinar, but when I started this program um, with with this group of women uh, at at Michigan's only women's prison, I I had reached out to a couple of of people that that I found like through documentaries and the internet that I knew were doing it, but, but it was really isolating work and I was doing things largely by myself. And so having this network of, 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 of support uh, of other people who were doing the, the same or similar work um, and then alumni of those programs too um, has been really beneficial, not just for me, but for, for, for everyone involved in our program. Um, and it has allowed us to, you know, <laughs> like, like be, yeah. be excited about doing research like this and sharing it with everybody. Um, and then how do we build on each other's work? Um, yeah. How do you workshop this idea? You know, the initial idea of the case study that we, there was a conference and I, we went to it and, um, I was, I workshopped this with just about anyone who would listen, you know, to get this, um, together. And, there was a lot of people who um, read the first drafts of my incoherent <laughs> framework. And, um, you know, Franny was saying, like, no one wants to read a case study. Like, try reading the case study I wrote originally. <laughs> it was, like, unreadable. Matt, Matt pretty much was just like, I'm just going to, like, rewrite this from the start. Uh, and it's way better. But, um <clears throat> Yeah, it's like it, that Shakespeare in Prison network and those conferences was really where this a lot of the the kinks in my thinking got worked out. Yeah. Kudos to all you people. Did we was journaling part of the experience before the study? No, it was not. And um, the study actually um, is uh, like having that component. Um, you know, like we mentioned earlier, especially for people who were very quiet. Uh, during sessions, um, the journals turned out to be um, necessary to our understanding of how the program worked and how we could best support in individual ensemble members. So um, that's something that we we were. It was really important to us to 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 keep um, as a component of of the ongoing evaluation and the participant experience. Um, and I know that. The folks who did journal a lot found it to be very valuable. There were other folks who did not journal a lot, and that was fine too. Um, but we definitely, we as facilitators, got a lot out of what participants wrote about their experience. Um, and I know that the, like I said, the folks who did journal a lot um, felt that it, it it enhanced their experience as well. I'm going to look and see if I missed any other questions. If I did, again, I'm going to say it again. Email me. This is my favorite thing to talk about. Like anything related to this program is my favorite thing to talk about. And I should say there, there was somewhere yeah. back in there somebody who was uh, in the middle of the presentation excited about uh, ner nerding out on the details of the coding. And, and you should definitely email Franny or me or everybody uh, about that because, because we, can, we can talk you to death. And or 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 to to life to to more to an enhanced enhanced yeah. living through coding data from explicit and implicit and and thinking feeling and connecting and theatrical and operational this is the point in the evening where um where we say good night <laughs> because clearly the the uh the the director of the program has gotten a little loopy but um Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you to um, my amazing, brilliant co-presenters, Matt and Sarah and Kyle. And uh, thank you to um, <laughs> the folks who are doing the work behind the scenes, which is um, uh, the Detroit Public Theater team, Patrick Hanley and, um, and Kyle Steffick and Emma Wine. And um, thank you for your help this evening and the whole Detroit Public Theater family and the Shakespeare in Prisons Network and everyone who's here tonight. Um, join our email list. Um, talk to us about publishing our book. Uh, you know, email me every single question. And, um, and it's, it's been really lovely to be here with you. And we hope to see you soon. Good night. <laughs>